<laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Tonight we're going to be looking at the second letter to the churches in Revelation 2, verses 8 through 10. I'm sorry, 8 through 11. Last week, we looked at a review of the seven letters to the seven churches. We were looking at the patterns that God gave us as he gave us these seven letters, that all these seven letters match real churches that were around at the time. Those seven churches within those seven letters had seven points. And within those seven points, there are seven topics of interest within one of those points. The number seven is repeated over and over again. There are four levels of meaning for the letters to the churches. One is specific, that means it's a letter directed at that particular church. They had specific problems that no other church had, but in reality, we all have those problems, and that's why he said to share these letters with everybody. Number two, warnings, things they were doing wrong, that Jesus said, look, we see what's going on here, and it's got to stop. Number three, inspirational, to guide them to seek his holiness and his righteousness. And number four, prophetic. Now, in the prophetic, you have a future picture of the church. In all seven letters, it's going to spell out what the church is going to be like over a 2,000-year period. It was specific to them at around 90 AD. And when you put them in order, those churches line up with church history and actually match every period in our church history. And there are seven church periods. They line up perfectly. The topics going to the first church was perfect for the apostolic church. The topics for the second church, the persecuted church, was specific to them and also with that time period in the future. So you're going to see where these letters fit a pattern that is something somebody couldn't have figured out. Those letters also line up with the kingdom parables in Matthew 13. There are seven. You, you believe that? There are seven kingdom parables, and those parables line up with the letters. Besides that, you have prophetically Paul's seven letters to seven churches. Those topics all match the same topics that Jesus talked about in further detail. It's quite an amazing puzzle to put together, and everything is pieced so perfectly. If you take something out, it throws it all off. God is that perfect in everything that he does, that everything is lined up. And it's like, as I was telling somebody yesterday, it's like a three-dimensional chessboard. Probably ten-dimensional chessboard. He's putting pieces in that we'll probably never see. When we get to heaven, he's going to say, you know that verse? Did you know? And he's going to show us something in the Old Testament we're going to go, it was right in front of me the whole time. So it's, it's a neat time to be alive because there are things being found archaeologically, scientifically. All these things are, are just coming forth at a time when the Bible says we will be in a time of exponential knowledge. And that's what's happening right now. The Last week we went over the letter to the church of Ephesus. That letter specifically talks about a church that loved God that was so sold out for him that he had a bullet point list of all their works. You did this, you did this, you did this. You did awesome. Nevertheless, I hold this against you. Can you imagine your boss telling you that? I don't want to hear nevertheless. Now, when you get to that point, it's like all those other bullet points are gone. Everything you work for, he says, but. He says, return to your first love. And that's what the whole message was last week, is the church as a whole needs to focus on what is important. Keep the main thing the main thing. Jesus is our Savior. He died for us on the cross, and we need to hold him at the level he deserves. We need to keep him on that pedestal and nothing else. We need to be in constant prayer. We need to be reading the word. We need to be worshiping him, singing to him. We need to be serving him. We need to let his light shine through us. Everything else, if you seek him first and you're spending time with him and you're getting to know him, everything else will come naturally out of you. The servanthood, the love, that ability to go out and witness to people and tell them the truth, that comes from an intimate relationship. And we have to love him. He says that's the only thing that's going to save you. 
So that was so important in that letter. Tonight, let's look at Revelation 2, 8 through 11. This is going to be the letter to the church in Smyrna. Let me give you a little overview about that church period. As I mentioned earlier, this is the church period called the persecuted church. This period ran from roughly 90 AD to 312. I could say it was a little earlier. There was a law that was written, uh, a Roman law written to the leader or approved by the leader before Nero that said Christianity was illegal. Now you're looking back around 50 AD. The persecution concept was there. Nero went after everybody and he was vicious. But this letter was written in 90 AD. So that church period really is when I feel that starts that period of persecution that you could say the prophetic vision of this church was directed at a people from 90 AD when he wrote the letter. He wouldn't write a letter and say, hey, going back to 50, you people 50 years ago are, are going to be under persecution. He would have said, from here on, this is what you're going to expect. So it's not roughly 90 AD, could be a little earlier, could be 95 AD to 312. We know it stopped in 312 because Constantine made Christianity legal and in fact forced it on everybody, which was a pagan society suddenly was forced to become Christian and they didn't have any training. Mm -hmm. Imagine the, the leader of the world coming to you and saying, and it was coming to a Buddhist, today you're Christian, so open church tomorrow and you'll be teaching people all about Jesus. And they walk out the door and you just go, Okay, uh, great. Uh, I'll start with that. Okay, now you're going to start merging in what you know, your pagan beliefs, and with Christianity. Okay, so at that point, 312 starts the next church period. We'll get into that next week. Now, during this time, Christians were denied work. They were persecuted. They were killed. They were thrown in jail like John. He wrote this letter. He was being persecuted for his belief. It wasn't easy. I couldn't imagine a time living like that, yet we have it all around the world today in some places. Mm -hmm. Now, the church of Smyrna was most likely started on Paul's third missionary uh, trip, and you can see that in Acts 19.10. The city of Smyrna, which is now called Izmir, is a beautiful city 35 miles north of Ephesus in Turkey. The city at the time probably had about 100,000 people in it. Today, it's the second largest city in Turkey, and it has roughly 2.8 million residents. Mm -hmm. It was an important port city, just like Ephesus was. Now, imagine how many people would have been coming through there. All different flavors of people, all different religions. You would have had wealthy all the way down to slave. What a place to witness. Now, you could have been in a little small town right up the road that had... 600 people in it, or you could have a church here where you have people coming in day and night, and you have a lot of people, and a lot of times, a boat came in, and it was docked there for a while, so the people were staying in that city for a period of time. Paul, you can see in his writings, as they were trying to take him to Rome, they had to shelter here for the winter, they had to shelter here, here the ship sunk, and they waited here. Always, you're in a location for a period of time, nothing was quick, not like today. Back then, it took probably uh, six years for the post office to send a letter. I mean, it was just a very slow-paced situation. Okay. Um, many Christians were martyred there, including John's own apprentice, Polycarp. He was martyred there in 155 AD. He was martyred because he wouldn't blaspheme the Lord. And he said, bring on the flames. He didn't care. He knew what was coming. All he had to do was say, I don't believe in Jesus the Savior. And he could have walked away and he didn't. He said, go ahead, burn me. That's something we don't see in our culture. We don't understand it. We've never been through it. So when you see that picture, it's just it's mind-boggling. You think a person willingly went to a stake to be burned alive. I can't even imagine what that was like. And he said, I'll, I'll do it. I'm, I'm good. You know, we have no idea. And when we're pushed, who knows what we're going to do. Now, we just watched, uh, my wife and I watched a movie the other night. In 2008, three Christians were martyred there in, um, I can't 
can't remember the place it was called. Um, it was in Turkey towards the uh, western, I'm sorry, eastern side of the country. Broad daylight in a church environment, his five men came in to talk to three Christians there and try to debate with them and talk to them about why they should convert. They went with a with a reason. They brought knives and guns and they were going to kill them and they did. They killed three men. The case as of 2008 um, was, I can't remember, uh, I'm sorry, the video was in 2008. The case was in the courts for like five years, six years, and at that point they still hadn't come up with, a, with an answer because they, they don't care about Christians there. The population of Christianity is point zero 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 five percent there's hardly any and the turkish government paints christians in a very bad light so if you're going to be a christian there they they allow you to have religious freedom but comes at a cost if you're a christian you could be anything but a christian and if you're a christian you're gonna help what did you say that date was it was 2008 so back in 2008 here we have only 0.0005% of Turkey has any Christians in it. That's such a small number. There's so many people that need to hear the gospel. And what's sad is they're killing you. You go over there and they'll kill you. So to be a missionary there today could be your death warrant. But you know where you're going. And Jesus says, I need people to go preach the gospel. Because of their death, their story was in the news. They had the, their pastors speaking at a press conference. You had documentaries made about it. So you think, three people? Who cares? Does it really affect anything? But when that news story goes out to the entire population of Turkey, it means something. And if it means one Christian can speak the truth and stand out there in front of all the cameras and say, we don't mean anyone any harm. Instead of the government saying, they're out to do you harm, what a witness. So those three gentlemen did not die in vain, but they were willing to go. And that's what Turkey is like. It hasn't changed, as you can see, from old to new. Um, Smyrna means myrrh. That's where they get the name from, myrrh, which is an herb used for embalming people. It means myrrh, and it also stands for death. Because every time you think about myrrh, and the crushing of it that gives off a nice sweet aroma, it's used for death. Now, when you think of myrrh, you think of the gifts that the Magi brought to the baby Jesus. In Matthew 2, it says, Matthew 2, 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented for him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The gifts have prophetic and symbolic reasons. So the gold represents his kingship, the frankincense represents his priesthood, and the myrrh represents the death he would have to go through. It's something that the Jews didn't need at that time. It was something that um, mostly was done in Egypt using that myrrh. But could you imagine when Jesus went to uh, Jesus and his parents obviously took him to Egypt. They said it's not safe and you have to leave. When they went to Egypt, they could sell this and make a lot of money from it. They left Israel poor, but they had to survive. God provided them everything they needed. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Mm -hmm. And they could have easily sold the frankincense and myrrh and made more money and had lived there for a period of time without any need. So God provided for them. But just like Jesus didn't need the myrrh back then as a baby, he won't need it ever again. Because he rose from the dead, right? So he is a symbol. He was crushed for that, for our sin. Mm -hmm. And now he rose from the dead, never needing myrrh again. Now let's break down what we are going to study tonight. Let's, let's read the whole uh, section in context here. And then we're going to break down each each. Uh, sentence and figure out what God's trying to tell us. Revelation 2, 8 through 11. And to the church, I'm sorry, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. 
I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you're rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. If you notice, there's no criticism in that letter. It's very encouraging. After reading the first letter, when it said, you're doing great, but you got a problem, you don't see that here. He's saying, get prepared. This is what's coming. Now, he could have said, and by the way, you're also doing this and this. There's, there's, he doesn't have... No accusations. Do what? No accusations. No accusation against them. Mm -hmm. There is a section of the church he has a comment about. But it's not who this is directed at. Because I feel he knows the people that he says this one comment to in that, in that portion of scripture is they're going to get there. But the, the letter that, that is right here in context, there's really not a lot of uh, negativity towards them at all. It's basically encouragement, a message of love hanging in there. Stay the course, stay focused. Now, Revelation 2, 8, uh, uh, sorry, Revelation 2, verse 8. It says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. So here we see a title of Jesus. That, that title there is symbolic to the name of the church. So we talked about that a while ago. Here you have the name meaning myrrh, meaning death. So he says, the first and the last who was dead and came to life. It's talking about the death of him. He was crushed and died for our sins. He beat death. He came back again. Okay, so he died and came back. It's very clear. So it's not, we don't need a, a degree in rocket science to figure out what he's trying to say. Now, when you look at... Uh, the first part, the first and the last, several scriptures clearly show that the Lord God is the Alpha and Omega. Now, when you get into Isaiah 44, 6, it says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and there is no other God beside me. Revelation 21, 5 through 6, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. It's very clear over and over again. God is the first and last. But Jesus referred to himself as the first and last in conjunction with saying, I was dead and now I'm alive. And again, we know the history of Jesus. He died for our sins, he beat death, he came back, and he's God in the flesh. He's one with God. We always hear about the Trinity. He's the Trinity. It's like they're considering themselves one. I always explain this when I uh, talk about Genesis in the very beginning. When you see God building, creating the earth, and he says, let there be light. Jesus says, yes, sir, Dad. And he takes off and does it. Comes your fact. What do you think? It's good. The Holy Spirit is hovering above the waters, checking things out. Holy Spirit sees it, sends a message. God gets it. This is what I want. Jesus makes it happen. They don't see, see it any other way. They work together as one. It's not like... He's calling the foreman. If you don't do your job, man, you're out of here. They're not yelling at each other. They're not complaining. They're not fighting. There's no supremacy of who's who. Jesus always pointed to his father as being, he's God. You worship him, not me. He's always said that. But we will worship him as God. When he's here in the flesh and rules for a thousand years, and he's given the throne, we will worship him as, as God. He's God the flesh. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that. They believe he's a son of God, but not part of a trinity. 
They believe he just does the work of God. That there's no connection like that. John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. John 17.20-21 says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their, through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. It's very clear. He's gotten through. So if he gave all these titles, it's not just a meaning to that church, meaning his name is representative of death, which is what they're going to be going through. He's also saying, guess who I am? I'm God in the flesh. I'm the first and the last. Beside me, there's no other. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an awesome title, and there's six more. In all these letters, there's seven titles of Jesus through all these letters. There's probably 70 times seven titles of Jesus and then some. And we're just, we're just learning little nuggets. And it's enough to make us go, wow. He is God in the flesh. And we need to realize his importance, his power, his might. A lot of people treat Jesus as our buddy. <coughs> he's not really a buddy. He's not really a chum. We need to bow down before him and give him the praise he deserves as king. This sums it up real nice. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, As it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. We have no idea what's coming. He's the king. And there's more to come. And it's going to be fantastic. Now let's move on. Revelation 2.9. I'm going to break 2.9 down in separate pieces. 2.9 says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. At the time of this writing, the Christians had it pretty bad. Since Christianity was illegal, they couldn't just have a church. No one could know they were meeting. They actually had to have a sign in the ground that they would sign with their foot in the sand with the fish symbol to let people know that they're a Christian or not. And if somebody looked at it, they didn't know what they were doing and didn't say anything, you'd say, okay, move on. <laughs> it was a dangerous time. It was illegal. You couldn't get a job. A lot of these jobs, let's say you were a, uh, a metalsmith or a woodworker. You go there for a job and he says, oh, you believe in uh, Artemis? Or you believe in Zeus? You believe in Athena? Because uh, say to say Athena is our spokesperson, our spokesperson. We worship Athena here. And to work here, you have to worship Athena. What do you do? I gotta feed my kids. Do you lie? Do you say, yeah, I'll, I'll join and I'll, I'll be part of your group and your, your Tuesday night meetings? Or do you say, I can't do that? These Christians at the time said no. I can't do that. You could be ratted out by them. You obviously wouldn't get a job. That time period was so hard for Christians because can you imagine being attacked on every side, not being able to work. You couldn't talk about your faith. It was a horrible period. Now, he knew, Jesus knew what they were going to go through. He laid this out in this letter. And his letter is, as I said, a letter of encouragement and love. Hang in there. I know what you're going through. This isn't easy. He made it abundantly clear what was going to happen. It talks about their death. And when you see that, you think, uh, wow, um, death? I, you know, I, I didn't want to go there. It's coming. And they said, okay, I guess I'm going to have to deal with that when it happens. Revelations, uh, or Revelation 2.9. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, besides the Romans attacking them, they had Jewish believers accusing Christians of all kinds of falsehood. Mm -hmm. go, back, go back in the scriptures, look what they did to Jesus as they brought in false witnesses. Going back 
in Israel's history, they've always used false witnesses to get what they want, it seems. So here's Jesus with false witnesses coming in, and they still couldn't get their story straight. Mm -hmm. And finally, the, the high priest said, all right, forget all this. Just answer this question. Are you the son of God? Okay, forget all the stuff we tried to get you to get in trouble with. We, we brought these people in to lie and to get you in trouble. Forget that. Let's just go right to the point. Let's go to the meat of the matter. And he says, this is it. This is who I am. That's going on all the time here. So they are slanderous people towards the Christians at this time. Now, besides that, you have Jewish people that are converting, becoming believers. But they're holding on to their traditions and their faith. If you remember, Paul talked about that, about the circumcision. Mm -hmm. There's times when they had vicious arguments because they thought, you guys are not following Jesus properly. You need to do this. But it comes down to it's, you're saved by grace. It's faith that saves you and not works, unless any man should boast. They're pushing law. They're pushing works. They're pushing tradition. Adding that little Jesus. That's what saves you. That's when you get into the Gnosticism. You get a lot of these churches back then that had secret knowledge. And they would teach you these secret things because that was the only way you were really saved. I'm hearing of that today. I've talked to people online and, and had debates with them about the word. and They said, well, you don't know. You need to know this, this, and this. And then, when you do this, you'll be saved. I said, the blood of Jesus covers you like it covers me. Mm -hmm. And this is what it says right here. You put your faith in him and you're saved. There's nothing you can do to add to that. But people want to constantly add to it. And then the Gnosticism, imagine this secret knowledge. It puffs you up. You feel special. I know something you don't know. <laughs> and then these young Christians get sucked into it. So Gnosticism could have been spreading from the Jewish believers, or it could have been just people who thought they understood the word and made up a little more about it, twisted it a little more, made it more interesting to a believer to want to follow and follow these, the, these uh, steps to get saved. So when Jesus is saying that, and he says, I know you're, oh, someone in this place, sorry. He says, <laughs> I know the slander of those who say they are Jews or not, but they're the synagogue of Satan. That's, that's pretty deep. I mean, that's, that's, he cut right through it. They're of Satan. They're going to get theirs. This is, this is not to you. As I said earlier, this church, you're going to have to deal with it. The people that love me are being persecuted. Then there's another group in here. They say they're Jews and they're not. Oh, okay. Okay. So they say, they say they're Jews and they're not, and they are misleading people. So here you have a mixture of false teachings, true teachings, people willing to die for the cross, and other people not willing to die. Let's move on to Revelation 2.10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Now to some, these are just words on a page. They understand it. It's clear, but it has no meaning according to their geography. People in the United States, they hear this. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Yeah, I'll suffer for Jesus. We don't have any suffering here. We don't have any persecution here. We don't lose our jobs here because of Christianity. We have no loss. And they see a simple blessing like, I got to raise a child, you know, at work. God is good to me. God's blessing me. God promised persecution and trials. He didn't say, I will give you financial reward. We see things differently. We see this world, the United States, we see this world here as everything we're getting is a blessing from God, blessing from God, blessing from God, because we're so good, because we love Jesus. We're not seeing it that the persecution comes from being in the world and trying to tell the truth to lost people who will hate you. We never talk about Jesus. Life's good. We talk about Jesus, we get persecuted. That's bad. <laughs> we don't want that. So hearing this, from our standpoint, we look at it and say, that's, yeah, I believe in that. I, I would be persecuted for Jesus, but we have no idea what it's like. 
they did. When he says, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. You're right, Lord. And I know it's coming. Back then, they were ready. Because they've already been through it. It's already been building up character in that. Now, how many people would fall away in our church because persecution comes? Half? 75%? Maybe more? Mm -hmm. They can get pretty bad. There are people who've been going through persecution since the writing of this letter of Smyrna. 2,000 years, different places all around the world. Some places never stopped. So you have people around the world right now where this speaks to them today, but just not to us here. We don't understand it because we've never experienced it. But it's coming. Something to think about. The Bible says it's going to come again. It's we are going to be persecuted. Don't let it catch you off guard. We're already seeing our rights being taken away as Christians. If they're forcing Christian business owners to work with or marry gay marriage, you know, for gay marriage, mm -hmm. they'll force a pastor to have to do that or use his church for it. Whatever happened to freedom of speech? Whatever ha ever happened to my rights as a business owner? Not anymore. So we're losing the battle step by step, day by day. And where there should be a huge outcry, you're getting people going, okay. that's all right. Mm -hmm. No one's speaking out. The persecution's going to come faster because they've seen that we just lie down. Too lo we have to be loving. Christ's church is about love. Don't argue. Don't stand up for the truth. Kill them with kindness. Not really going to work. You need to speak the truth. You need to stand up for what's right. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing it. So we're going to have more persecution coming. It's amazing that a group of people would kill another group of people, even their own blood, over who they like. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we, again, we don't have this going on. ISIS over in the Middle East, they're killing their own kind. People from their town, people from their family line, they're killing them. They're cutting their heads off because of who they want to spend time with, who they believe in. John 15, 18 through 19 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. It's who we know. It's not personal. Mm -hmm. The three men that I talked about that were killed in Turkey. It's who they knew. And somebody came in and said, I don't want you to know him anymore. They said, no, I'm not doing that. And they were killed for who they knew. Again, it's not us. But it's going to be. They're going to see us because we are a reflection of Jesus. We're doing our part to try to shine a light of love, hope, grace, mercy, peace, happiness, joy, contentment, discernment. We're trying to show the attributes of Jesus. When they see us, it's like a mirror. Because they go, I'm different than that. I, mean, I guess I'm, I'm a sinner, but I'm not a sinner. I'm fine. Then they're going to get angry, and they attack us because they see Jesus in us. So we got to remember, when the attacks come... They're attacking Jesus. He died for us on the cross. The least we can do is the same. He willingly went to the cross for someone he really valued and loved. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to my turn, will I say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not willing to go that far. I love Jesus, but I'm not going to get my head cut off. If that's what we have to go through for him, to spread the gospel as those three men died, but got the word out to all of Turkey, all about Jesus. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. There was a, a sheriff's deputy that was working an off-duty job in Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale. He went, uh, he was on a foot patrol at a Cadillac dealership because people were stealing their rims off the Escalade Cadillacs. Comes around the corner, and there are guys over here with jacks, and they're stealing the rims. I don't even think he had the time to say anything. 
somebody was watching, came up behind him and shot him in the back of the head. Mm-hmm. He was a Christian. He was a missionary. His parents were missionaries. People at his, his work were calling him pastor. He was teaching the other sheriff's officers about the Lord. People said, why would God have let one of his children die that way? Why would God have let this happen? About 4,000 police officers came into our church and heard the gospel message because of his death. His parents sat in the front row, looked at our pastor and went. (laughs) Knew where their son was. Knew they'd see him again. It was sad, but they said, I know. And they said, wow, his death brought 4,000 or more because our church only held that many to see they were standing room only in the hallways they were outside they could hear the speakers the gospel message was preached and it was a clear message you need a savior today and he had a savior and he is in heaven right now and it was very clear the guys got saved that day the death of one can bring hundreds if not thousands to the lord we have to look at it that way is why are we here this is a short period of time this life doesn't matter we have an eternity waiting for us. This isn't even a hop, skip, and a jump in relation to what eternity is going to be. What we think here is, is a blessing. What we think we need. I need stability. I need my house. I need this, this, and we don't need any of it. We need to live for Jesus and tell people about him so the kingdom gets further. And one day when we're in heaven and that one person we reached from because we didn't care and we we just went out, didn't care about this world. We, we reached out to all these people. That one person comes up and says, because of you, I witnessed to these five. And those five witnessed to five. And those five witnessed to five. And all of a sudden, behind this one person you witnessed to, it's 500 people. Is it worth it? Mm-hmm. Yes. I think it is. Yes. I think it's, it's it, it far away as anything this earth could ever give us. Revelation 2.10 I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. As I mentioned earlier, these letters are prophetic, outlining or outlining a seven church periods. This specifically ran from 90 A.D. to 312 A.D. So he says, you'll be in prison, and you'll be, you'll suffer persecution for ten days. 10 days is not 10 days as we know, it's 10 periods of time. During this time, from 90 AD, they have 10 Roman leaders that were, out of all that period, some of the worst. That was a horrifying experience to be a Christian there. Mm-hmm. So I find it remarkable that you have a time when Jesus says, there's 10 periods coming, and it's going to get bad. And here we have 10 really bad leaders. Prophetically, he told them what's coming. Warned them. And a lot of them died. It was rough. Um, And that's just the, that's the 10 worst. There were others in the middle of those, which were... Not so much a, a, a persecutor, but nonetheless, it happened. Just because this particular Roman ruler didn't push too hard didn't mean that the Jews didn't. Or didn't mean the shop owner didn't. Or the mob down the street. Because they all worshipped a certain idol. And because you just said, no, there's only one God. And his son Jesus is salvation. Suddenly, you just took his religion and spit on it. So he gets a whole bunch of other believers, and they come and they trash you, stone you, they burn you at the stake. So just because a leader at that period within those 210 years wasn't bad doesn't mean it wasn't a bad time. So that's why they call this period the persecuted church. It was a horrible, horrible time. Mm -hmm. Revelation 2.10, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, it must have been hard to face as he says, death is coming. Way to go, yay! That's not not happening. (laughs) It's already bad. What do you mean? I can't even find a job. 
It's a bad time. Persecution does spread the gospel. Imagine a guy comes to a town and he's skilled laborer and he can't get a job anywhere. But he ends up moving from town to town. As he goes, he tells people about Jesus until he finds a place where he can go and make a living. The persecution will push the church to farther locations and regions. But if everything is good, you stay in your circle. You don't talk to anybody. You never leave that town. But because of this, you had to leave. There's no denying it. Or there's a posse coming to get you. So the persecution helps to spread the church. Now, another thing to think about is, as he says, be faithful to the point of death. What do you gain out of that? Because you hope there's something to be gained. As I said, we hope there's salvation. We hope the kingdom is spread. But imagine what it does to you. Imagine having a life of persecution and it changes you to be more humble, to be more patient, to be more faithful, to be more loving, more understanding. Right now, I can go talk to somebody and say, hey, Jesus is the way to go. Somebody says, no, he's not, you're an idiot. What? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll whoop your high, boy. You know, some places in the South, they're gonna whip your high if you say anything against Jesus. Back then, in this time period, do you think it would have gotten anywhere to start a fight in the middle of the street? Who would have been called? The Roman soldiers. And then they'll whoop your butt. And they would whoop your butt. You would have been arrested. You would have been persecuted, possibly killed. So do you think it would have been a good idea to tone things down a little bit? <laughs> Quiet down? Don't be so forward? Different ways of talking about Jesus. Do you ever think that there's something out there that loves you, just start a conversation like that. Instead of saying, let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, here's a Christian, come get him. <laughs> Maybe drop those hints, a verse here and there, an Old Testament verse. Start with the Jewish community that already knows the word of God and step up piece by piece. This lifestyle also made you a better witness. And under persecution, people would see you shining your light and you say, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Remember Stephen was stoned? And he says, he's looking up at God. He says, wow, I see Jesus on the throne. And he's joyful. Imagine the guy throwing a rock. Why is he smiling? <laughs> you know? I, I just, he's, I can't really get angry. I don't understand. Who is this guy? Why is he happy? Why is he saying, forgive I heard uh, from the, the movie we watched in Turkey, to forgive someone is a sign of weakness. Because you have to basically eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. You don't back down. Christ is about saying, Here, here's the message, take it. If you don't want to take it, you want to abuse me, that's okay. Because I know where I'm going. It's a different mindset, it's a different picture. It's a different lifestyle. That lifestyle can change souls, it changes you. It makes you different, it makes you better in all ways, and helps you to reflect Jesus, and that's the whole point. Persecution not only drives the church, but makes us better believers. Because now, instead of being worried of the coming onslaught from Rome, we're a little more quiet, reserved. We're now reading, studying faithfully. Because you know what? We may, may not have a, the ability to have this. So I have to study to show myself approved. I'm going to be in the back rooms by candlelight, reading the scriptures, memorizing and getting it ready. So when the day comes, I can just regurgitate the word mm -hmm. of God. We need to be wise. That's what we study. Yes. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's what they were doing. Know how to talk to somebody. Know when to talk to somebody. So it makes you a better Christian. A great overview of this. 2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 10. It says, giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance 
in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not, to, not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Even though the world sees us as one way, it doesn't matter. We don't care about these things, the beatings, the imprisonment, losing it all. We have what we need in Christ. Share it. Live it. Time's coming when it's going to be very difficult. Revelation 2.11, he ends with, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. He gives them hope. Very have a bad letter at this point. Man, you're in jail, you've been persecuted, you got death coming. Stand firm. Because you won't be hurt by the second death. You're gonna live forever. That's a gift. Mm -hmm. You're gonna live forever. This earth doesn't matter. He gives us hope. He gives us that ability to, to dig down into our faith and trust him. So this letter is a letter of encouragement. As I read through it, you, the first time you read it, you go, wow, that's hard. Second time you read it, you go, that's true. The third time you read it, you go, wow, he loves us. He really loves us. Anytime you study, you got to read the scriptures like 10 times. you got to <laughs> read it, read it, read it, read it, get it ingrained and try to understand what he's saying. you got to read the paragraph before the paragraph, after it. You have to understand what he's trying to tell us. In all these letters, stand firm. Don't give in. We all give in every day. All of us sin. Repent. Turn back. Stay on the straight and narrow path and enter through the narrow gate. As I said earlier, prophetically, these letters also line up with the kingdom parables. It, it lines up with Paul's writings. The kingdom parables, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, says another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest we gather, uh, lest you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them together in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Here's a picture of the Jewish believers coming in and stirring up strife. The Gnosticism that was still going on. It was happening in the early church. It happened here. It's going to happen really bad after this. So he's reminding them, let it grow. Another reason why, like I said, that guy right there did this. He's blaspheming the Lord. Let's chase him down the street. And the Roman soldiers come. What are you chasing him for? He, uh, I don't know. I think he uh, took my dog. I mean, what would you, you were about to get arrested too. Let him grow together. Just let him do it. Let him grow up. You're going to have some bad in there. I'll sort it out. Don't worry about that. You stay the course. Mm -hmm. You be firm. You be strong. Those other guys, they had no future. The people who know the word of God are not going to be swayed. Now, Paul's writings, Paul's letter to the Philippian church lines up with this completely. Just like the book of Ephesus lines up to the letter, the church of Ephesians, right? Or the book of Ephesians lines up with the church at Ephesus. Sorry about that. Now, when you read um, Philippians, what I did is I pulled out the main points and then pulled out the scriptures to show you how this 
is not just thrown together. It's not one man over here coming up with a topic and one man over here coming up with a topic and they, they kind of jive. This is amazing. Topic from our letter tonight. He knows there are hard times for his people. In the book of Philippians 2, 17 through 18. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Hard times are coming, but be joyful through it. The second point, he reminds them they're rich because of their salvation, right? Philippians 3, 7 says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Paul said, Everything I thought I was working for and I was piling up doesn't matter. The thing I find value in is Jesus. That's where my faith is. That's where my hope comes from, my power, my love. It's all from Jesus. Three, he points out the intolerance of the Jews and rebukes them. In Philippians 3, 2, it says, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. The topics are all lining up. Four, he tells them not to be afraid of persecution. Philippians 1, 27 through 28 says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that when, whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear um, of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but the salvation for you, uh, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Point five, he tells them some will be jailed. Philippians 1, 12 through 14 says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. You can't get any clearer than that. Look what happens when he's in prison. It gave them encouragement and hope. Point six, he tells them they will suffer for 10 days. Philippians 1, 29 through 30 says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here in me. Seven, be faithful even to death so you can receive the crown of life. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Same thing. God gave Paul a message 40 years ago right, to, to, to this, the writing of this letter, that so aligns with what Jesus is going to tell the church then and what it also is going to tell the church in the future. So we've had persecution for 2,000 years, off and on, all over the place. We've not experienced it, but there's been persecution everywhere for 2,000 years. This letter is an encouragement to the entire church, especially for what's coming. I hope in tonight's message that you see how important it is to stay firm, to not bend, not go to left or right. Stay in the word of God so you know it. Be ready for persecution and not cower. Stand up. He says you'll be given a crown for that. There's many crowns. I can't imagine how many crowns there are. But in the end, it says we'll all throw our crowns at his feet. Mm -hmm. He is going to be the author, the perfecter of our faith. He is going to complete us in the day of Christ Jesus. We need to seek him and be an example through it all. So be encouraged that in the worst of times, he's with us. In the best of times, he's with us. And at all times, we need to reflect him so we can bring others in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen.